Welcome to Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends. The only podcast where it's okay to talk in band. On this podcast, you will be able to hear conversations with some of the greatest names in wind band conducting, composing, and arranging. We'll also visit with great college, high school, middle school, and elementary band directors to get their thoughts on various aspects of being a band director. We'll have regular check-ins with instrument specialists, music dealers, and instrument repair professionals. And if that's not enough, we'll even have regular conversations with Dr. Tim, who will help keep us motivated. That's Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends. And now, here's Charlie. Welcome to Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends and this, episode number 49 and number 10 in my second season. I am so honored that you are joining me for a wonderful conversation with today's guest, Dr. Daniel Belangia, who is the professor of music and director of bands at Arkansas Tech University, in Russellville, Arkansas. I've known Dan for a whole bunch of years, and he is a double sharp young guy. And I know you're going to enjoy our conversation where we talk about the influences that helped shape Dan and his career, as well as a new CD he has out with the Arkansas Tech Symphonic Wind Ensemble. And it features a new composition by James Seiler, his uh, Symphony No. 2, and Roy Magnuson's The Softest Breath. Great pieces. But before we do that, let me take a minute to thank my sponsors for this podcast. The Eastman Musical Instruments Company, makers of Eastman wind instruments, Eastman strings, Eastman guitars, Shires brass, Bakun clarinets, Haynes flutes, and bourgeois guitars. Old Chinney, Saul Friedgood, and the team at Eastman, they continue to produce instruments of the highest quality for everyone from beginners through professionals. So check out their complete line at your favorite music store. A big shout out to Hal Leonard, publisher of the Essential Elements Method for Band, of which I am honored to be a co-author. And by the way, if you haven't checked out the Essential Elements interactive website, that comes free. Yes, free, as in purchase a book and the Essential Elements interactive website is available to you for free. Check it out, man. It is an amazing resource and it grows each and every day. And Hal Leonard is an amazing company. I want to give a shout out to Drew Holmes and Ward Dirt at thepodcastingstore.com where you can get anything and everything for your podcasting, virtual teaching, and audio needs. You'll hear a little bit more from them in just a minute. And thanks to my pal Kevin Lepper and his Advantage Network Percussion. Great products, great prices, but Kevin has something nobody else has, and that is Kevin Lepper. He is the best in the business when it comes to taking care of people and taking care of business. No drop drumsticks here, my friends. Kevin doesn't miss a beat, and he will take care of you with the products you need. And finally, say, uh, thank you to my friends at Vandercook College of Music. I just saw the lineup of Mecca continuing education classes they have for the summer, and I said, whoa, man, it is another all-star lineup of great practical classes with fantastic instructors. I'll tell you what, and I know this from having spent 23 years at Vandercook. They just continue to raise the bar, and that is something I am so proud and happy to see. So check out the great array of classes at vandercook.edu, and if you have a student or you know someone who is interested in becoming a music educator, in getting their Bachelor of Music Education degree or their Master of Music Education degree, have them check out Vandercook. It is a great school with a great tradition. So this week, the Slater Clinics was announced for the upcoming 75th Midwest Clinic, and it is a great lineup. With COVID-19, like most everything else in the world, the Midwest Clinic went virtual last year, but plans are moving full steam ahead to have the 75th Midwest Clinic live in Chicago. And if you're a band or orchestra director, well... I'm sure you can't think of a better tradition than the Midwest Clinic if you've been there. 
started 75 years ago by H.E. Nutt of Vandercook College of Music, Howard Lyons of the Lyons Band Instrument Company, and Neil Chose Sr. of Chose Music Publishing. The idea was to have a conference where teachers could learn some new teaching techniques and refine some old ones. They could get an idea on what to do and how to do it. They were able to see the new band and orchestra instruments that were on the market, and they were able to take a look at new band and orchestra publications. The year was 1946. The average annual salary was $2,500. Gasoline cost 15 cents a gallon, and the average cost of a new car was just over $1,100. And oh yes, you paid 85 cents for coffee, a two-pound bag of coffee. My, my, how some times have changed. The Midwest Clinic started out in a YMCA on Chicago's east side with about 120 directors in attendance. 75 years later, it will be held in the expansive McCormick Place of Chicago. And you're going to need more than 85 cents to get a cup of coffee, let alone a two-pound bag. But you will still get to hear some great performances, and you will still get to attend some great clinics, and you will still be able to see the new instruments and peruse the latest pieces for your ensemble. It's going to be a sign that life is getting back to normal. So start making your plans now. Do some research. Contact your administrator. Write up a proposal to let them know the benefits that attending the premier professional development event for band and orchestra directors will have for your students and will have for you. If you've never been to the Midwest Clinic before, you will leave and wonder what took you so long. And if this is an annual event for you, well, uh, it'll be great to see you again. We'll be right back with Dan Belongia. This is Drew with thepodcastingstore.com, your one-stop shop for everything podcasting and remote learning, and a proud sponsor of Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends. Listen to what we've been working on in this clip from our podcast. So a question I keep getting asked uh, when I talk about doing a, a three camera shoot and syncing it up with the sound and all that kind of stuff is, how do you do this? And so um, the video that we made showing uh, the new connector that we have for the wireless microphones was a great uh, opportunity to do that. So for that shoot, it was three cameras, uh, one on me, one on Ward, and one on close up on his hands, two microphones, because there's two of us that are talking, and then um, working the problem backwards, you got to hold the smartphones with something. So then we needed three of the small rig clamp mounts plus the Vastar uh, phone holders. Uh, two microphones require two cables, and I've got one microphone here on the table, the other one I'm using right now to record it. To hear the rest of this podcast, please visit thepodcastingstore.com, your one-stop shop for everything podcasting and remote learning. This is Drew with thepodcastingstore.com. Now back to Charlie. Well, it was a long time ago I got a call from my dear friend and this young man's teacher, Gary Green, and he said, uh, I got one of my students going to be in Chicago, and he's got a situation he wants to talk to you about. He says, take good care of him, will you? And I said, absolutely, Gary, anything for you. And Lo and behold, into my office walks our guest, and we had a wonderful conversation, and it was the start of a long-term friendship, and it's uh, something that's uh, been very, very special to me, and uh, it's really an honor to welcome to the program Dr. Dan Belanja, who is the Director of Bands and Professor of Music at Arkansas Tech University. Dan, it's been a few years, but welcome, buddy. Charlie, thanks so much for having me, man. It's great to hear your voice. Hey, you know, you've been at Arkansas Tech, what, since the fall of 2015, you're in your sixth year, and, and of course, many of our listeners, I got a, lo a large listening base in Illinois, and many of them will remember from the 10 years you spent at Illinois State University, but, but tell us about where the young Dan Belanja grew up and how music came to be a part of your life. Sure, yeah, uh, not far from Chicago and, and your old stomping grounds, I grew up in Kenosha, Wisconsin, just, just over the border. It, it, from Illinois, and um, my um, my original band experiences were, I think, like so many of of us. Um, my my family valued music, and um, I remember seeing a marching band, and just thought that was the coolest thing I could ever imagine doing. And uh, so, was fortunate to be able to join the band. So, talk about your school band experience, and and. 
you know, uh, as I was doing some research on you, you had uh, some some very powerful uh, teachers, your junior high school teacher and your high school band director. Uh, and I, I trust that was in the Kenosha area. That's right. That's right. I just, uh, you know, I try to, when I have opportunities to do clinics with groups that are strong and, 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 and the players have colleagues that are clearly talented and dedicated, I, as often as I can, I try to re- remind and express to them that it's hard when you're in junior high and high school to appreciate the fortune of that. But, but I can do that when I look back at my young experiences. The Kenosha Band Boosters and the Kenosha Music Program for decades has been a point of pride in that community. And so uh, it was valued and cherished and the teachers were and are incredible. And uh, my junior high band director was a person named Ken Wheely, who was the first teacher that I knew I wanted to be when I grew up. I, I just fell in love with Mr. Wheely and he happened to be a trombone player and he was a jazz improviser and he played basketball in his free time and he just seemed infinitely cool. And he saved me. I, I was committed to quitting the trombone and I was harassing my parents about it. And Mr. Wheely turned it around for me. And at Washington Junior High, we created a culture out of thin air just by his impulsive will. And he's still a guy that I call when I'm trying to figure out what the right thing to do is and looking for inspiration. And then the high school band was led by Al Sabo. And Al was a legend and is retired now, living in Arizona. And he was my mother's band director at Bradford High School and then was mine uh, when I grew up. And Mr. Sabo's program was culture and was about repertoire and was about performing at the highest possible level. And he became kind of the second band director that I said, boy, if I could ever be like that person when I grew up, uh, I grow up, I'll just be the luckiest guy in the world. And so, you know, the older I get and the more experienced I get, just the more I appreciate how fortunate I was to have those people in my life to give me an idea of what was possible. So how did you get from Kenosha to the University of Miami to start your, your study? Yeah, the, you know, it's it's a, a kind of amazing. And um, now that I'm a father, I sure hope my children don't wanna do this to me like I did to my mom and dad. Um, I didn't know a thing about the University of Miami, but I was uh, really into playing the trombone and, and into my high school band experience. But I was also kind of into uh, calculus and physics and math. And I, and I wondered if there was any way to combine those things. And the University of Miami uh, has a program called music engineering. And as I started to search the world for what might possibly be math and science, it sounded like the thing. And at the time, Miami was doing satellite audition uh, experiences. And there was one in Chicago. And so a person from Miami came up to Chicago and uh, there was an opportunity to make an appointment and you went and I could audition. And I remember speaking to Ken Moses, the associate yeah. dean, yeah. And, I, and I explained that I was nervous and I, I wondered if he could tell me what exactly I needed to do. And I remember clearly, he, he said, well, listen, we can do this as many times as you need. Please relax. Remember, I'm just here to record the audition and take it back to Professor Campbell, the trombone professor. So I'm here to help you any way I can. Try to relax. We can do this 10 times if you want, but good for you. And so I, I, I played my audition. And as it turned out, uh, I was admitted and I was offered uh, enough scholarship that uh, we could make it happen. And I made a visit down to Miami and I traded, you know, snow bluffs and slush for palm trees and sunshine and was going to be a music engineer. And uh, I had no idea what that was, but it sounded like a good thing. So uh, when I got to Miami, uh, I quickly realized that music engineering was an amazing thing, but maybe not necessarily for me. And that kind of manifested itself in October when I was meeting with the advisor and uh, we were doing spring semester scheduling. And again, I remember this really vividly. I, I, I was registering for spring semester classes and I wanted to be in the wind ensemble and I wanted to be in the trombone choir and I wanted to be in the second jazz band and I wanted to be in a brass quintet and I wanted to play in the symphony orchestra. 
And I remember the advisor from music engineering saying to me, why do you want all these ensembles? Are you insane? And I said, I might be in the wrong major, maybe, huh? And he said, I think you are. And I sort of bent to the universe who, and a lot of family and friends and those band directors I just mentioned, who'd been saying for quite a while, Dan, you should be a band director and switched over to music education for the spring semester. And there you met the man with the hair, Gary Green. You, you know, that's, uh, that's true uh, in a roundabout way. That spring semester, this was spring of 1993. And this was when the University of Miami interviewed a person named Gary Green. Wow. I thought at the time that in order to be a music education major, I should transfer out of the University of Miami and maybe go to the University of Wisconsin. Or, or go back and somewhere towards home to do a music education degree, because basically I was at Miami for the engineering program. And in the interview, Gary Green did his thing that Gary Green does, that you know about, and any listeners that have had the opportunity to be in a rehearsal with him understand. And even in that hour, he transformed the whole feeling of the wind ensemble. And I thought, there's something magic about this person that I want to be close to. And uh, when he accepted the position, he did the groundwork of communicating with who was in the studios. And as I understand it, the professor of trombone may have mentioned to him, yeah, well, this kid's probably transferring out. And Mr. Green made the extra effort to give me a call. And he didn't you know, ask me to stay at Miami. He didn't recruit me back in. He, did, he just said, what's going on? I heard you might be transferring out. And I said, well, I'm, I might be because I'm going to do music education. And he said, well, if you stay, there's going to be a lot of music education going on. And, you know, and, and uh, it might be a good situation. And um, that's all I needed. I mean, I was already all in because of who he is. And you know what? I like Miami. So I wasn't too excited about leaving anyway. And so I, met, I did meet the man there and then was part of his first year, then my sophomore year. That's great. So did you stay on at Miami then to get your bachelor's and master's or did, was there a, 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 a split in the middle that you went out teaching? I tried everything I possibly could and Mr. Green would not la let me. I begged him. I said, please let me do a master's degree in conducting with you. I, I want to I wanna learn from you. And he said, get out of here. He said, you got to go teach and you need to go learn some things and then we'll talk, which was, of course, absolutely the right advice. So, uh, I, I mean, Charlie, I, I was thinking about talking to you about this. And in a sense, it's, it's overwhelming, again, to remember just how darn lucky I've been over and over and over again. And I was lucky to be in Miami at the right time. I was lucky to be in those high school and junior high band programs with Wheelie and Sabo. And then I was tremendously lucky that through uh, a million circumstances, I had the opportunity to be on the band staff at Bamble Middle School in Spring ISD in Spring, Texas, uh, my first year teaching, uh, working with Charlotte Royal and Sharon Kalasek, incredible band directors in the state of Texas, in Richard Crane's Spring ISD, that first year teaching. And I just, uh, I mean, I had no idea how fortunate I was in the moment. It's another one of those things when I look back and just realize, wow, what a circumstance I had as a dumb 22 year old, but thankful for it. And Mr. Crane is still a father figure in my life because of that. Um, Mr. Green wasn't the most thrilled that I wasn't teaching in Florida. And I did, uh, and I say that, of course, you know, a little tongue in cheek, of course, he was very supportive and very proud of me there, but he encouraged me to come back and teach Florida in Florida, and I wanted to be a high school band director. So I ended up just spending a year in spring, and an opportunity at Mariner High School in Cape Coral, Florida, became available for me to have an opportunity for a rebuilding program there at Mariner, and I had a wonderful uh, period of time there in that program, and then was fortunate to move to Dr. Phillips High School in Orlando. And then during that time, you got your master's with Gary? No, during that time, I kept begging 
Mr. Green, to let me come back to school. And I think I finally whined and begged enough that he just gave in and he said, okay. So uh, I think it was seven years uh, between my undergrad and my master's that I came back uh, to UM as a graduate assistant uh, with Mr. Green to do the master's degree. So you finish your master's and then you head off to Michigan State where yep. you, stu- you study with uh, John Whitwell, who is a, another great one in the band world. And uh, just absolutely another giant and another stroke of incredible luck. I had developed a bit of a relationship with Mr. Whitwell because he was an evaluator in Indianapolis at the Music for All Concert Band Festival. And our Doc Phillips High School Wind Ensemble played. And he gave us the most, just period, the, the most profound clinic I've ever been a part of as a conductor with my group after we performed in Indianapolis. And uh, that evening, there happened to be a, a, a gathering, a social gathering. And Mr. Whitwell asked me if I'd ever considered graduate school. And I said, I said, I have, I, I, I think I wanna be a university conductor when I grow up. And he said, great, we should talk about that. And then, you know, that was still a few years before it happened. But um, fast forward, Mr. Green told me there was an opportunity at Miami and I was, uh, I had the opportunity to talk again to Mr. Whitwell. And it turned out that in two years time, there would be an assistantship, uh, the, the Ken Bloomquist Fellowship actually at Michigan State that would be open. And so in that same moment, uh, Mr. Whitwell committed to me that should I go to Miami for four semesters and do the master's degree, I could then move to Michigan State and begin the DMA, which is what we did. Wow. So, so looking back with your time with Gary Green and, and John Whitwell, uh, talk about the similarities they shared in their approach. There's, there's just so many. Um, the, the bottom line is in both of those men, my whole life now, I feel like uh, they are the consummate musician and consummate human being, both of them, that musically and otherwise, I cannot think of better role models. They, they give everything and always did in all their rehearsals. Um, and just role models in day-to-day life. And, and that's to me um, the most profound similarity between both of them. How about differences? You know, I mean, we, we all got our own style. You got yours, I got mine, they got theirs. Was there any, any real difference you look back and say, this is how they were the same, but they were still a little bit different? You know, it's a funny question. I, I don't think I could even begin to imagine what, what, how, how I could describe them as differently. They, they both represent such profound gifts to me. I love them both so much and owe them everything. They've been a foundation for me for as long as I can remember. And um, I I love them dearly. They're they're both, of course, different human beings, but um, so similar and most profoundly, I suppose, just so such a gift to anyone that has the opportunity to study with them or just be in a rehearsal around them all around the country. Yeah, they are, they, are, they are truly great. When I was a high school band director in Kansas, this is a thousand years ago, uh, John Whitwell was at Stephen F. Austin High School. I'm sorry, Stephen F. Austin uh, University in, in Texas. And his band played at uh, CBDNA, which was held in Kansas City. And he asked, he called me uh, through Gary Hill and asked if he could rehearse at my high school. And he rehearsed at my high school and he had three composers with him that night. Frank to Kelly, Michael Doherty, and Karel Husa. <laughs> Man, I was like, wow. And I had a band mom pick up Karel Husa from the airport. And that, might that have been that, might that have student. been the might that have been the premiere of Desi? You know, I think it was. Yeah. I think that was the CBDNA tour. Yeah. That was the premiere of, of what became Desi. And I know he had Doherty on the program and I, and I sure hope I don't get this wrong. And, and, and if I do, please everyone forgive me, but I believe that's the story where Mr. Whitwell commissioned Mr. Doherty and initially it was supposed to be a James Bond piece. 
And that CBDNA program, I believe, is still printed with the world premiere of the Michael Doherty piece 007. But it just didn't manifest itself. <laughs> and at the last minute, Doherty called Whitwell and said, I can't write you this James Bond thing, but I do have this Desi Arnaz at a tiki bar in Cuba thing that I think might work. And that's where Desi came from. Oh. Please forgive me if I'm wrong, all involved, but I think that I think that's, that's the circumstance. That's a great story. I'd never heard that before. That's great. Yeah. So you've been teaching at the university level, Dan, for what, 16 years now? Yeah. Uh, how, how's Dan Belanger changed over that time? I mean, what, what do you bring to your students differently now than when you first started? Oh, I, 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 I hope so many things. <laughs> I, I look back and, you know, uh, one, of my, one of my Illinois State students and I were, were talking over Facebook recently, and it occurred to me that I, uh, they are now, uh, my students at Illinois State in 2015 are now, uh, a pro excuse me, 2005, not 2015, but uh, they're approximately the age I was when I was their band director in 2005. And, and that's a crazy thing to consider. Um, I, I, I hope I've learned to be a little more patient. I, I hope that I've learned to see the bigger picture more often. I know that uh, I became a parent in, in 2008. And I know that being a parent changes everything about your teaching. Um, just the ability to think about how you hope your child's experiences with teachers happen changed everything for me to, to remember that no matter what, these, these are young people that have hopes and dreams and, and, and worries and insecurities and problems at home. And, and you know what, they want to play in band and they want to play well and they want to pat on the back and 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 at all levels we need that and um i think it's probably a a, a not unusual young person um mistake that i know i didn't do that all the time and i probably don't do it all the time now either but i sure do hope that i'm a little bit better at that now than i was as a younger person and uh, i hope i'll be better at it 10 years from now than i am today oh i'm sure you will well, yeah, let's let's uh, shift here just a little bit. We kind of make some course course change here. So you study with Gary and you study with John Whitwell, and I know that they both love repertoire and they love the opportunity to work with composers on new repertoire and new commissions, and, and that all had to be a part of your experience. So, uh, as a college student, what are your recollections of those times sitting in an ensemble? This is a new piece; nobody's ever heard it before. We're making that first sounds, that first creation, that first uh, impression. Uh, what do you remember from that? So many things. And, and, and so often to me, the, the profession comes down to the music and the people. And, and perhaps that's just a terribly obvious thing to say, but I have always found it so incredibly magical. And yeah, Mr. Green, infused our rehearsals with guest composers and, and new repertoire and exciting sounds, always energy in the rehearsal. And I will never forget the first time David Maslanka came in the room and the first time Michael Colgrass came in the room. And I mean, I was just like a really annoying student, I gotta imagine, poor Mr. Green. I mean, just because I would never leave him alone. And I just wanted to inject myself in the middle of everything because I thought it was fascinating. So I wanted to drive the composers to the hotel. I wanted to try to angle my way in to be able to be on the end of the table at the dinner later on. I wanted to know where the coffee was going to happen so that I could be in the same area as the coffee and just try to absorb fr from these people. And I remember Michael Colgrass waltzing around the room during urban requiem rehearsals. And I remember David Maslanka weeping while describing his love of the art and his love of the music and, and feeling like what we were doing mattered on a, in a way that I couldn't have described before. And 
So absolutely, uh, it, it has just become part of my hopes and dreams as a professional myself that I could ever create environments like the ones that I was so fortunate to be in at Miami and at Michigan State, where David Maslanka went to school and where David's son went to school and where Mr. Whitwell was a great advocate of all of that music as well. So you carry that repertoire gene with you, obviously. And, and I know that when you were at Illinois State and you were doing the wind ensemble there or the symphonic band, I don't know what it was called. I can't remember, but you had a, you had a CD that you produced that was called Point Blank. And that really received uh, rave reviews. Uh, since you've been at Arkansas Tech, I trust you've done some recording and I, I understand you have a CD coming out. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah, we're, we, we were really fortunate to record at Illinois State and, and um, we, we've just completed a project here now as well. And uh, some of the, there's a little overlap. Uh, my great, great uh, collaborator and dear friend, uh, Roy Magnuson was on both uh, CDs now, uh, the Illinois State CD included my, my dear friend, uh, Paul Dooley, who's just incredible, as we know, uh, the unbelievable Jennifer Higdon's percussion concerto, um, Scott McAllister, uh, and our new CD from Arkansas Tech it features the new symphony by James Seiler at UT San Antonio, and it's his second symphony, which is an incredible new addition uh, to the repertoire. And, and that, um, to me, was so exciting as a player and a student and continues to be now. So um, we all follow in the footsteps of giants. You, you, your uh, series has included so many of them. I was listening this afternoon to your talk with Professor Reynolds and the, the impact that he's had on our profession is immeasurable. And, and Mr. Battisti, who worked so tirelessly to find the greatest composers and, and, and bring them into the mix. Uh, just recently, I was in a conversation with a colleague, uh, a professional musician, about a concerto possibility for him. And he said to me, uh, well, that's exciting, but I don't know if I know any of the band composers. And I, it's still funny in, to a degree in 2021 that, you know, that, that can come into play. And, and, but it was a terrific opportunity because I said to my friend and colleague, that's fantastic, and and I it, please don't worry. I mean, I don't want to hear about quote unquote band composers. I, I don't. That's not a thing, really. Uh, there are people that write wonderfully and predominantly for bands. Uh, Dr. Maslenka wrote predominantly for bands, but it, he wasn't a band composer. And and if you, I told my colleague, if you bring an idea of a composer for our project that I've never heard of. I'll be thrilled that I can go home and try to rectify that. And if it's a composer that we can bring a new voice into the repertoire for wins, then I, I feel like I might be on the coattails to some small degree of the great tradition of leaders in our profession that have done that now for a few decades and, and have been such crucial elements of fleshing out our repertoire. So what, when you're gonna plan a disc, you're gonna record a disc, what comes first? Does it come, do you say, okay, I'll, next year we're gonna do a recording project. I gotta find some pieces for it. Or is that a two year project? Or do you say, I've come across these composers. I've got to get them to write something. And then once I get those pieces, I said, man, this has got to be shared with the world. How, how does that, how do you, how do you? Uh, you know, um, you know I, I have a total of two experiences here now. So, you know, uh, you know qualifying there that, that I'm, I am no, expert, certainly. But the two experiences with which I've uh, led the project were a little bit different because, as you know, um, Illinois State was in a real habit of recording. And uh, when it was my opportunity, we followed the blueprint that was there before. And so in that situation, I'm sure I thought, well, the recording project time is coming up, so let's build our repertoire around that blueprint, that architecture. Uh, at, at Arkansas Tech, this experience was a little bit different because uh, it, it came together um, not out of routine, not, and, and that's the wrong word. The, the, it wasn't routine at Illinois State, but it was scheduled. And uh, But here, 
it, it, we'd been kind of building toward it for, for a few years. And like, I suppose, many things, it was a lot of circumstances all together. Um, I met through a, a, a blind email, a person named Christian Amundsen, who the band world needs to really get to know, and I believe really will very soon. Christian Amundsen is the uh, one of the um, owners and operators of a company called Arts Laureate, and now a label named Tonzean. And he's retired as the recording engineer from the United States Marine Band. And Christian emailed me and asked if we were going to do a recording project anytime soon. And could he describe what he would do if given the opportunity to record for us? And Christian is a genius. And he took such time to make this blind email. We didn't know each other, but he made it so personal that he got my attention and had done a lot of homework about who we are and what we were gonna do that circumstantially, uh, circumstantially, excuse me, we had a new piece by Roy Magnuson on the, um, on the, in the planning and we had the new piece by James Seiler and all of these circumstances came together for us to be able to record. And uh, the pieces are fantastic. Uh, I'm so proud of the work that our students put into all of it. And Christian and, and his team are incredible. I, I can't wait, Charlie, for you. I'm gonna send you a copy of this CD as soon as it arrives tomorrow. And I really can't wait for other people to hear it because you're just gonna be knocked out by the engineering of this thing and Christian and his team's incredible work. What's the name of the CD? So we can our listeners can look for it. It's, it's Siler Symphony Number no. 2. We, okay. we, it's a little bit of a self-titled CD. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, the Siler Symphony is 22 minutes long or so, and the Magnuson is about eight. So it's a short disc. Uh, we really had some plans that November of 19, when we recorded, those would be some building blocks. And then we were going to record a little down the line. And then uh, COVID happened. So uh, when looking at those circumstances, we realized, you know, it might be a whole other year or more before we have another 20 minutes. We just decided to, to put the disc out with 31 minutes of music or so in it and um, just let it be called Symphony Number no. 2. Great. OK, we're going to go another direction here with you. Uh, in your role. You serve as a, a valuable resource to school band directors. I mean, you're in Arkansas, you got a great program, but you're also a resource. You go out and do clinics and workshops and, you know, you finish your, you finish your work at the university and you jump in the car and grab a burger and head out to do a high school band rehearsal somewhere, you know, and you've done a lot of these. You've done them in your area. You did them in Illinois. You've done them nationally. If you can go back and teach a class right now, based upon your observations, what are three things you'd want to make sure that, every one of those directors, not every one of those, but directors learn or learns again about being a band director. Yeah, the, the, it, the, this is a tough one, isn't it? Because you, this was your whole career as well as mine. I, I still teach in the music education curriculum. So, um, you know, I don't have to think about if I were to go back um, tomorrow morning at 7.15 a.m. We have laboratory band with our music education majors. And they'll come to the podium and tomorrow one of them is conducting Salvation is Created with the other 35 or so in the room. And um, it's how do we boil this down to three things? You know, I, 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 I'm tempted to, to, to refer to things like learning all the instruments and being able to create correct tones and modeling for students, which are wonderful and crucial ideas. But I wonder if that happens without the energy in the room, what is it worth? Um, I, so I, I, I find myself more often coming around to the idea that the right note at the right time is our starting line, not our finish line. That, and, that, and, that, and I say that and I worry that that sounds like I'm demeaning the craft at all, but it's not at all what I mean. We, of course, must do those things. And in order, to, in order to do those things, our students need correct posture and correct apertures and correct positioning. And they need to know their valves and they need to know how to operate the machine. But the operating of the machine in itself 
lacks poetry. And without poetry, what are we there for? And, and when I have opportunities and, I, and I'm with a, a high school or a junior high school band, I was, I was really fortunate last week, uh, Ram, Robert Ambrose and his incredible team at Georgia State manifest mm-hmm. the Southeastern Regional Concert Band Festival. And I got to interact with nine groups that were finding ways to make it happen. And in many cases, we got a live Zoom back and forth with some, some students and, and they didn't have their instruments most of the time and they were kind of spread out. And sometimes they were even all just on their iPhones. But it was still really rewarding to, to hear them laugh and, and get to talk to students again. And, and those nine bands were, were making inspiring things happen, whether that's the, the, the repertoire or the actions, the activities in a band program, like playing for the Southeastern Regional or the good old days of taking a trip. But it's an element of culture that I think perhaps is all encompassing. I think if, if, if our program is energized and our students are excited to be there and they feel like they're important and they feel like this is worthwhile, then technique can happen in, in, the, in the pursuit of that energy and the pursuit of that feeling. So culture and energy to me is, is crucial. Getting out of the ivory tower a little bit. I'm, I'm in a bit of a, an interesting role because I'm, I'm teaching music educators right now. I'm trying to be the best music educator I am. And I'm a band dad. And my daughter is in the fantastic school band programs here and is a seventh grade oboe player. And so I'm able to sort of look at it now from that other angle. And I know getting out of the ivory tower here, just how important good old fashioned communication and organization is. And and so we try to stress to our students that in as much as we do the the energy, culture and artful kinds of discussions that our students need to understand that uh, you have to be an organized uh, professional and you have to be a good communicator in order for your program to thrive and your students to thrive. So you got a girl that's in the high school band playing oboe. Uh, Junior high. Oh, junior high school band. So, Don't fast forward on me, man. She's 13 already, and it's already scary. <laughs> what do you want that director to bring to your daughter every day? That, uh, sorry to be redundant, but that energy. I just want her to be happy she's playing the oboe. I want her to get goosebumps to come up on her arm every once in a while. I want her to have an imagination for what that oboe sound can be when it moves you to tears. And I want her to feel like that that magic, nobody can manifest it all the time. Nobody can, but you have, to, you have to know that it's possible. And you have to know that that environment there is one that's conducive to the potential for that. And then all we need, any of us, is just a little bit of that magic every once in a while. And that sustains us through the calisthenics of long tones and thirds and scales and articulations, the stuff that's like the gym that is crucial. We have to have some of our rehearsal lab be the strength and conditioning coach of the football program. But then if it's just that, there's no games, there's no passion and art and and goosebumps, then then what are we here for? And so that's what I want for her. I just want her to feel moved and, and excited and energized. And then I know that, you know, she'll take care of the rest. That's good. That's great. Yeah. We can, we can all hope, hope for that for for every musical experience isn't it uh well you've conducted a lot of honor bands i'm sure you've done some all-state bands and and we've all been in those situations where we go there and we go like what in the heck has happened with these guys since the time they got their music and now right and and so what are some things that directors can do or tell or make sure happens with their students so that when they show up at, at an honor band or a festival band that they're going to get the most out of that experience. Yeah, there's, a, there's, I, I, I love them. I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm so honored that anybody asks me to come and do a region band or an all state band or, or an honor band because, um, you know, I, 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 we can backtrack just a bit if you'll forgive me. Another one of those origin story kind of stories was was the first time I played in the Wisconsin all state band, and Gene Corporon was our conductor. And he programmed the Gandalf movement from the Lord of the Rings. 
And I remember that exactly because the trombone section was positioned right behind the horns. And the best 12 horns in the state of Wisconsin in that honor band that year parted my hair for three days. And I had goosebumps continually for three days playing in that group with that conductor. And that honor band experience was a major part of realizing if there's a profession where I get to chase this feeling, then that sounds like a pretty cool way to have a life and spend a life. So every opportunity I have to do one of those, I'm trying to match that example of Mr. Corporan and that Wisconsin Allstate Band. So how do students get there uh, so that they can have that moment and that experience comes, you know, it, it, it comes down to preparation, I suppose. Uh, directors perhaps can influence that by reading as much and as often as possible with their students. Um, I'm, I'm kind of on a soapbox lately. I'd like us to reconsider the term sight reading and maybe just refer to it as reading because I think sight reading implies great danger and spinning knives and, you know, pools of acid. And uh, none of us grab our phone and open our email and sight read the new email because we, we all know the language and we trust that there's not going to be a preposition or a phrase that we're not going to be able to manifest because it might have, you know, a compound sentence or extra apostrophes. And so we read. And maybe if we read with students as often as we can, when they move into an honor band experience, they'll be a little more familiar with that. And then they'll be able to relax. Um, I think just a collaborative spirit is vital in those experiences. And when students have come from programs where it is more interactive, uh, Mr. Whitwell uh, used the incredible phrase with us that, you know, kind of the old school model of band leadership was where the person on the podium had the small end of the cheerleading cone and the large end was at the group at all times. <laughs> and the more evolved model is a little more of a tube. Um, I, I, I share with my conducting students as often as I can that I think an interesting uh, coincidence is that the word conductor outside of our profession means a material that doesn't take energy away from what's put into it. A, a, a metal is a good conductor if you put electricity in one end and just about the same amount of electricity comes out the other end. It doesn't take any away. And you know what? I think a good musical conductor does the same thing. If we take that energy in us and we don't make it less, on the other hand, if we can make it more, then we're a good conductor. And it's hard to do that if your students are simply feeling like I've got to be quiet, sit still and do what I'm told. <laughs> and then that will be OK. If our students feel like they can be expressive, then maybe they get that goosebump moment that I want for my Jenny. And maybe then we can build something greater than ourselves. So uh, my favorite honor band experiences are when there's a bit of that energy in the room where students feel like they can relax. I, I'm not a small person. So I've come to realize too, that when I come to the podium, I don't necessarily give everybody the most comfortable feeling all the time, especially young students. They see the college guy coming and I can be scary. And, I, and I, so I try not to be scary, try to assure them that they can take chances and, and that mistakes are not only okay, they're what we're here for. And by finding where the red lines are and then backing off them just a little bit, we'll find where the music can live. Yeah. You know, you get to sight reading and I, I'm a big proponent of that. And uh, I wish I could go back in my career and, and start over just to make sure that I would uh, do a lot more sight reading, you know, and I think where directors miss the boat, Dan, is, is uh, they've got libraries full of music at their schools and, and the school below them, and that's not below, but the, the younger school, the, yeah. the middle school, the elementary school, they've got filing cabinets of music that's rotting right now. And if they would just go back and access a piece of music, that's probably what technically two grades easier than the level that they're playing right now. So the kids have some, some sort of success and it sounds pretty darn good, you know, and even, even putting sight reading pieces on a, on a concert, my buddy, Steve Horniman, who was uh, retired from Brebuff Jesuit in Indianapolis, 
used to have a sight reading piece and he put it on the concert. He put, put it in a manila envelope and it was called sight reading on the concert. And he turned around to the audience. He said, we're going to read a piece of music they've never read before. And this is what it's going to sound like. And I'm going to take a couple minutes and explain it. And then we're going to do it. And so and, cool. And the kids loved it. I mean, they got yeah. to the point that the sight reading was going to be fun because all of a sudden yep. now it was something new for them as well. Yep. So yeah, that's, that's really cool. That's yeah. Really you know, and, and, and I understand. And so do you, I know, I mean, boy, it is tough to be a junior high and high school band director right now. I mean, the, the requirements on them every day in and out are just, I mean, I've been out 16 years from my last high school job. And I know that's like a lifetime now and the pressure to be ready on Friday night and the pressure to get that superior at festival and the pressure to prepare those students for solo and ensemble and the pressure to be prepared for everything that's coming up next is very, very real. And I understand how a lot of directors might just be sitting there and thinking, well, that's nice to listen to these two college guys talk about all these nice things that we should be doing when they don't understand how tough the schedule is. But, but we do. Um, my daughter's oboe teacher, who is my colleague at Arkansas Tech, had the most brilliant suggestion recently. I'll just share with everybody out there. Ken Futerer said, uh, when I was asking him, how can I help Jenny become a more uh, comfortable reader? He said, grab a church hymnal and put it on the piano. And every day she plays the next hymn tune. She can play the soprano line and just every day. And so now it's one of the things that Jenny does is we just, we have the hymnal on the piano and every day she turns the page and she has to read the next one. So she's going into all kinds of keys, she's going into all kinds of meters. They're not overly complicated, so she can be pretty successful. And every day it's just like a little new experience. That's a great suggestion. Yeah. yeah. Okay. A couple of rapid fire, short answer questions to, to wrap this baby up. Uh, I think I know the answer to this from your earlier thing, but if you didn't become a band director, what would you have been? Actually, I think I would have been a coach. I'm not really? sure that I'm not sure that music engineer thing was ever really going to be right. I, I, I just love being with people and I love having goals and I love trying to get better and stronger than we are today. And, and there's just so many parts of our job that are kind of similar to coaching that I, I, I just wonder, you know, I think, I think I might've been a coach. Okay. You can go back in time. You can have a beer with any conductor or composer who is no longer around. Who would it be? And what would you want to talk about? Leonard Bernstein. Absolutely. Leonard Bernstein and anything he wants to talk about. I want to talk about West Side Story, uh, but I'd want to talk about anything he wants to talk about. I'd want to talk about Mahler with him. I'd, I'd want to talk about those two recording sessions of all nine symphonies and why he made the changes that he did. Uh, anything he want to talk about. That's great. You know, I asked that question to, to quite a few of my guests, and I, I would say that nine out of 10 say Bernstein. Really? Yeah. Oh, that makes me feel terrible then. No, How boring. Oh, no, why? That's not boring. I, I, yeah, think, I think it's well, affirmation is what it is, you know. Do you know Steve Wiest? I, I know the name. Trombone yeah, player. jazz trombone player in Maynard Ferguson's group. Yeah, then, he was at uh, he was at uh, Lawrence University, wasn't he? He, he was at Wisconsin Whitewater. Oh, Wisconsin Whitewater, that's right. And yeah, so yeah, yeah. my incredible high school band director, Al Sable, had him come in and solo with us. And so I got a chance to have a couple lessons with this guy that played with Maynard Ferguson. And he left Wisconsin Whitewater, went to the University of North Texas, where he was jazz faculty for many years. Just yesterday, Steve Weiss published on Facebook. But Facebook can be problematic at times, but boy, it still does have really special gifts. And Steve Weiss's post yesterday, today's April 1. So if anybody's listening, wants to go look for March 31, he has this incredible footage of Carreras and the West Side Story recording sessions for the movie and the soundtrack and and Steve's post describing the heat I mean Bernstein let's be honest he, he wasn't always the nicest guy in rehearsal and in this video he's not being really very nice and it's inspiring how this musician is hanging in there all the way to do what had to be done and as we says in his post they did achieve perfection by the way at the end of this so hard for those musicians involved, but they all made it happen. And that's part of the reason I just think he'd be incredible to talk to. Yeah. I've seen that video by the way, before many years. Oh, ago. you have. Oh yeah. It's oh. been, it's been out there for a while, but it is, and you're right. It is, there is some heat going on there. Oh, 
man, yeah. you just, and there's, there's lots of them. You can find a YouTube where, where, where Bernstein brings that to, to some musicians and you think, I'm glad, you know, I wasn't in that hot seat, but <laughs> he was one of a kind. Yeah. So if you could go back and give the young Dan Belanger some advice, what do you, what would it be? Oh, be patient. I guess, you know, try to just be a little bit more patient and realize that it's all going to happen in the time that it's going to happen and, and that it's okay. Yeah. I, I say the same thing. I say, you know, it's a journey. It's not a destination. Yeah. You know, you're so busy getting to the end. You know, you're like, you were talking about earlier, like teachers, uh, you know, my, my running joke is like, man, I don't have time to teach music, man. I got a concert. I got to get ready for Isn't you know? that a good joke, right? Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> Any final thoughts, Dan, before we wrap this thing up? Oh, I mean, boy, I can't thank you enough for the opportunity to come and chat with you. I've, I've, I've just, been such an admirer of yours for so long. And I am also so grateful for Mr. Green putting us together. And then I got to be your colleague in Illinois for those 10 years. And, you know, just the, the opportunity to think here seriously about those people in my life has been uh, really moving here uh, just since we, we started to talk about this. And, um, and I cannot express I just do not have adequate words for my students and the, the people that have been part of it for me that without which none of it is possible. So um, I cannot, I cannot express to them what I know I owe to them and, um, and what they've given me. Well, it's always a pleasure to chat with you and see you and to watch now from afar, your, your great success and you're doing wonderful things. And I know you're going to continue on a, on a really great trajectory like you are right now. So I wish you the best, buddy, and I'll see you down the road. Okay, pal? Thank you. Thank you, sir. You can always tell the character of someone by the way they speak of others and the respect they show for those who've helped them along the way. Listening to Dan Belongia talk about Gary Green and John Whitwell is something we can all learn from. It is obvious they had a great impact on Dan. And they've had a great impact on so many others in our profession as well. And years from now, there's going to be someone interviewing someone on whatever the podcast medium of the day is. And they'll be talking about band and band directing. And they will talk about the influence that Dan Belongia had on their life. That's the way it is, isn't it? We are the benefactors of those who have paid it forward. And we must always remember to say thank you. And the best way we can do that is to make sure we continue to be a positive influence in others' lives, like Dan Belongia is doing with his students at Arkansas Tech. Well, that's Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and friends. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll be back with more great interviews. So please continue to spread the word about Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and friends, available on Apple Podcast or wherever you get your favorite podcast. And until the next time... This is Charlie Mangini saying, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends. If you would like to send a question to Charlie or have a comment, please send an email to bandtalkcharlie at gmail.com. We hope you will let your colleagues, students, and friends know about Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends. Thanks for joining us, and we look forward to being with you again soon.